Now, I've been doing a series, as you know, who've been, you know, following over the last few weeks on Psalm 23. Let's go to Psalm 23, just to re look at it here for a second. This is a psalm written by uh, David, who was the, the shepherd king of Israel, who God took from following, as he said, the sheep and from the sheep pens and made as a ruler of his people. But the Lord is my shepherd, he, he confessed, okay? The Lord, Yahweh, the eternal, the holy one of Israel, okay, this is what it's talking about. The, the, the holy one of Israel is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. On all those verses, I have done now a series of sermons. You can catch them on COG Webcast. If you haven't seen them already, pick them up. There is so much meaning that is, you know, in what seems like simple verses. And, but this is the nature of the Bible. The Bible is extremely rich tapestry of meanings upon meanings. And it, it is, it is, it's wonderful from this aspect. This week, this Sabbath, we're going to go over verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. At least this is the first half or part A of this verse. Of course, the division of the verses is not inspired. Okay, that was done at a much later time, you know, when they divided up in chapter and verses. But this week, it is you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What does this mean? You know, Philip Keller in his book about a shepherd looks at the 23rd Psalm, he talks at length how a shepherd, you know, would, exam would go up into the high country, up, up into what he would call the tableland, or the Spanish would use the word mesa. In Spanish, that uh, mesa is, means table. And he would, there, he would look it over, and he'd see the best places where the grass was growing, and he'd preposition salt licks, you know, for his flock, and he would try to dig out poisonous Swedes. Because uh, from this aspect, Keller uh, did uh, at least started when he had his own flock in his own land. When he started here in coastal BC, one of the poisonous weeds he had to dig out was the white camas uh, bulbs, and so the flowers. Because if the sheep, if a lamb ate a white camas uh, flower, it could actually kill him because it's highly poisonous from this standpoint. However, you know, you know, in, in going through what Philip Keller has to say, I, I think he's really not focusing on the right thing. Because, of course, when David wrote this, he wasn't thinking of Western United States with his great tablelands or, you know, something like this. No, David was doing his shepherding around Bethlehem in the uh, Judean hills. And these were not the incredible high lands that we have here in Western United States. Now, if we're going to understand what David was talking about here, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, we're going to have to dig into the verse a little bit and see it in the context of the scriptures themselves. Now, in the, you know, when it says you prepare, the Hebrew word there is strong 6186. It's Iraq. Iraq is to arrange or to set an order. And, you know, it means it's used in common life, everyday sort of life, to mean setting up or arranging the dishes on a table for a meal. You prepare, you know, you, you know it's very clear, you prepare a table. So it's, it goes into this idea of, you know, preparing the sin, setting out things so it's all in order. However, in the scriptures, this Hebrew word is oftentimes used figuratively in the context of arranging army weapons in order in preparation for battle. You know, you would prepare to, though you draw up the army if were to prepare for battle. It was also used from that aspect as well. Of course, two different, very different means, but one is a figurative and one was actually what they had a literal sense of it. And I even sometimes, you know, it's very interesting. Sometimes combined God in, in how he inspired 
in the scripture. Sometimes he even puts both meanings into the, the same context from this aspect of, of the word. Let's go to Isaiah. Let's go to the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 21. And, you know, it's, this is a prophecy that God was going to, was commanding the city of Babylon to be taken. Now, when Isaiah prophesied, this was, you know, uh, better than something in the neighborhood of a hundred and and uh, uh, about 120 years or so before Nebuchadnezzar appeared on the scene. So this was long before the, 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 the actual historical events that Isaiah was talking about would, be, would come to pass. So in some ways, you know, like all prophecies, it has a fulfillment which was historic, but it also is talking about something that is in the future. But let's take a look here and see how um, Isaiah is going to use this idea of preparing a table, you know, before me in the presence of my enemies. So we, verse, uh, ch uh, chapter 21 of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, verse 1, I'm going to read this in the Amplified uh, Bible version. The oracle concerning the desert of the sea. Now this is an interesting introduction. Concerning the desert of the sea. And, you know, the, the Amplified makes a note that um, the plains just south of Babylon were seasonally flooded because they were on one of the, I think it was, they are, they're on the great uh, Euphrates, aren't they? It's, if I get the Babylon, it's from that aspect. You had the Tigris and the Euphrates, and I think they were on the Euphrates uh, from that aspect. But this, during the winter, the days before they built dams, this area would f would sometimes flood if they, you know, during the that period of time. Okay, so it's concerning the desert of the sea, which the point is here, it, uh, it, it defines this as Babylon. It's, this is a city in the ancient world where this was identified with. As windstorms in the Negev sweep through, so again, this idea of a big windstorm coming up from the south from this desert area which is talking coming from the desert this is you know it's symbolic of God using the idea of a geopolitical force a foreign army as a rod of his anger to punish this area so it so it was concerning that this desert by the sea as windstorms from the Negev sweep through it so a terif uh, <clears throat> so it will come from the desert from a terrifying land verse 2 a harsh vision has been shown to me the treacherous uh, one deals treacherously the destroyer destroys go up elam lay siege media all the groaning the groaning that was caused by babylon's ruthless oppressions i the lord have brought to an end Therefore, you know, continues Isaiah, my loins, that is his, his, his gut, he's, it's filled with anguish. He was, you know, he's talking about your you know, stomach being all knotted up. Pains have seized me like the pains of a woman in childbirth. I am so bent and bewildered that I cannot hear. I am so terrified that I cannot see. My mind reels. Horror overwhelms me. The twilight I long for has turned into fear and trembling for me. You know, it would be from this aspect, you think about this, in modern times, it's like when the Allied armies would sweep into Berlin and annihilate it and destroy the Nazi reign uh, or go into Japan when they would drop the bomb and destroy the area or firebomb some of these cities. It's the same sort of thing that he's portraying, that the fear, the sense of fear that would overwhelm people. But then he calls, he says this, my mind reels, verse 4. Horror overwhelm me, overwhelms me. The twilight I long for has been turned into fear uh, and trembling for me. And see, look here, verse 5. They set the table. See, they're preparing a table. They, here's the same word being used um, for, for setting a table. And they spread out the cloth. Or as another version says, they prepare a, a table and spread out a carpet because you know, in the ancient Middle Eastern, when you're preparing a feast, you'd roll out the carpets and you'd have a low table and everybody would sit around the table. That's the way it was originally done. 
when the Greeks came through later on, hundreds of years later, they would sit on benches and they would recline. But at this point in time, when Isaiah is writing, they would do it very much like the Bedouin would do it right now. If you were going to any place in, in the desert or something and they have their, their tents, I don't know if you've ever seen one of these, but they'll, maybe I suppose if you look at Lawrence of Arabia, the movie, they, they do this. They'd roll out the carpet and, and they'd have a table and they'd set it, they'd set it with dishes. They eat and drink. Then rise up for your enemy as is at the gates. You know, here it's the idea. Here they're, they're setting the table, then all, and it, but they're doing it sort of in the presence of their enemies who are getting ready to destroy them. Verse 6, this is the, what the Lord says to me. Go station the lookout, let him report what he sees. When he sees a chariot, horsemen in pairs, a train of donkeys and a train of camels, let him pay attention and listen very closely, very closely. And the lookout called like a lion, O Lord, I stand continually on the watchtower by day, and I am stationed every night at my guard post. Now look, here comes a troop of riders, horsemen in pairs. And one of them said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, and all the carved image of her gods are shattered on the ground. O oh, my threshed people, O oh, my threshed people, this was God's people, this was Judah, which was going to be punished by uh, Babylon and trampled down, their, their government, their state destroyed because of their sins. But God is saying that, he, that he's saying to them, O oh, my threshed people, my afflicted of the threshing floor, when I have heard from the Lord of of hosts, the prophet is saying, the God of Israel, I have joyfully announced to you that, you know, essentially that Babylon is to fall. So we see here a, a message of encouragement. We see that even though, you know, from the standpoint, the enemy, they were getting ready to have a feast, you know, this idea of Belshazzar, we, you, can read, or you can read about that in other places, okay, in and, and Daniel. You know, they were all assembled, because this is what it's portraying. They were going, they were having this big feast, and all of a sudden, at that moment, they were to be destroyed. And that's, this is actually what historically happened. It's, it's an historically accurate picture, but it's also pro pro prophesying of something in the future, that God's people who would have been punished from that standpoint will at one time see that those who, who, have, de who have destroyed them, those who have, who have oppressed them, will eventually receive something else. They'll eventually see, receive the justice of their ways. Now, besides the word prepare, the arok, arok that we just looked at, there are the other you know, important word in this passage here of uh, Psalm 23 and verse 5 is table. Now, as I said, you know, I, when I was reading through this, and I was reading uh, Keller's book, you know, I, he, he was trying to make the, the table, trying to the table lands of Western United States, these mesas. But this is not what the Hebrew is implying, actually, because the, 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 the Hebrew word is strong 7979. It's shohan, shohan, and it, it means a table. I learned this when I was studying over in Jerusalem, and I studied, you know, that was one of those basic words, you know, sit at the table, you know, this sort of thing. But it, you know, it's used. It can be used for, particularly in the scriptures, they use it for like a king's table that they would have everyone gather around, or it could be used just in a, in a normal sense of a household table for a meal. But let's take a look here in one of these uh, of how it was used at David's time. Let's go to First Samuel and verse twenty and verse twenty-seven. First Samuel, this is the uh, uh, latter prophets. <laughs> former prophets, I should say, 1 Samuel 20, 27, Holman Christian Standard Bible. Now, the day after the moon, new moon, because of, okay, they were keeping track of God's calendar, okay, the Hebrew calendar, which is Luni solar, and they would make note of the new moons to keep that calendar. Now, the day after the new moon, the second day, David's place was still empty. That is his place at the table, the king's table. And Saul asked his son, Jonathan, why didn't Jesse's son come to, to, to the meal, either yesterday or today? And Jonathan answered, David asked for my permission to go to Bethlehem. He said, please let me go because our clan is holding a sacrifice in town, in Bethlehem. And my brother has told me to be there. So now, if you are pleased with me, um, let me go so I can see my brothers. 
That's why he didn't come to the king's table. And if you were to con continue to read on, you know, this answer Saul did not like from his son Jonathan. He didn't like the fact that Jonathan had, you know, had, had this story of why the son of Jesse wasn't at the king's table because Saul was planning on killing him. <laughs> but, you know, for, for as long as this period of time after the slaying of Goliath, David had sat at the king's table. He, God had prepared for him a way to the kingship. He had anointed him to become king over the Israel to replace Saul. And, he, and eventually it didn't take Saul all that long before his sense of jealousy and envy, the this, this spirit that was in him, picked up on that. And for quite some time, yes, it was the Lord who prepared, uh, you know, he's, he prepared a table in the presence of his enemies and he sustained David even in the very presence of someone who wanted to kill him. Even in the very presence you know, truly David did have this personal experience. Thou preparest for a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You know, a whole variety of the commentators notice this, and they, they see this, that this, this idea is that God is furnishing his people with plenty. And a whole variety, they'll say, you know, a whole variety of good things, provisions and comforts, it, but he's, he does it even in the presence of this enemy, meaning that those who see this, those who are envying this, those who are fretting at it, are not able to really hinder it at the end. Saul tried to kill David. But as we know, I mean, he chased him all around the land of Israel. But he wasn't able to do it because God wouldn't allow it. Because David did what was pleasing in God's sight for the most part, and he didn't allow Saul to slay him. He set a table, he provided for him, he encouraged him, he's prepared a table for him in the presence of his enemy Saul. The Lord's people are going to feast at his table. You know, they're going to feast on all the good things that God is going to give him. He's going to give you these, this opportunity. And Satan and all of those who are his minions, oh, I like that word, you know, we have this thing with it. You know, his minions will not be able to prevent it. They're not going to be able to destroy the future for God's people. This is an insurance, you know, this is a very reassuring thing. To pre God is going to prepare a table in the presence of our enemies. You know, this idea, too, of, of preparing a table wasn't just a physical table like uh, this one or even Saul's table, the king's table, but it also, the table, you know, Shulhan is used in another context in the scriptures. It's something that is very important to note. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 41. Ezekiel chapter 41. Now, this is a prophecy in Ezekiel of a future time. It hasn't occurred. It's a prophecy most people in the religious world totally overlook. They don't want to think about it. Because it's a prophecy of God reestablishing a temple, a house of prayer for all people in the future. Something that has not yet come to pass. And when you read through what it is saying in this, it, it disturbs a lot of people because it, bl it blows away a lot of the religious assumptions that a whole pile of people have made. But if you notice here something, and we're talking about shulhan, this, this, this Hebrew word shulhan, you know, prepare us a table uh, for me in the presence of my enemies. Anyways, before me, in Ezekiel 41 and verse 22, I want to cite this here. <coughs> Just to pull out this one point with this usage of the word. Ezekiel chapter 41 and verse 22 in the New Living Translation. There were square columns at the entrance to the sanctuary. Because, of course, the, the, this temple is a magnificent structure. And it's because it's not just a humble dwelling. It's a magnificent structure. It has these enormous columns. And the ones at the entrance of the most holy place were similar. There was an altar made of wood, five and a quarter feet high and three and a quarter feet across. You know, this about gives you the idea of, you know, it was originally given in cubits, but 
the NLT translates it into feet. Its corners, base, and sides were all made of wood. This, the man, which was an angel who is talking with the prophet Ezekiel, is the table that stands in the Lord's presence. So we see here the, the, the idea of a shulchan, of a table, is also used, has a spiritual meaning. And let's take a look here. I want to see something because God uses this in a sense to, um, you know, because it, because it is a feature of the temple. He, he uses it in a variety of teaching contexts to make a point. And let's go to Psalms, in the Psalms, Psalms uh, verse, chapter 78, Psalm 78. Psalm 78. And we'll start here with verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will speak dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. See, God is the dwelling place from generation after generation of his people. Verse 4, we will not hide them from their children, showing to the generations to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers that we should teach them to our children, to, to their children. So the generations to come might know children which shall be born and they shall arise and tell their children. You see, this is one of the obligations of God's people is to teach our children to teach our children of this testimony of the law which God gave, you know, the, of the gospel that he established once and for all time, for all generations. He gave us this responsibility. There are very few people at this point in time in this generation that take this seriously. Many of the kids who are growing up now, they know nothing of any of the biblical stories. They are, they are strangers to the covenants of promise. They are strangers to what is being taught. I hope that you are, if you have children, you are teaching your children. You're, and you're showing them the right example. Not a hypocritical example, but a right example of being a person of integrity so that the teaching you give may resound with your children and that they may be encouraged by it rather than be turned off by it. Anyways, verse 7. So that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. But keep his commandments. Very straightforward. And might not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set their heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful with God. Well, that's talking about us right now, that's for sure. The children of Ephraim, armed sh <coughs> shooters of bows, turned back in the bay day of battle. So here were these people talking about the people of God, okay, people who were, they were well armed, they had the material, but you know, they didn't have any backbone because they had wandered away from God, so they had no courage. So they turned and ran in the day of battle, something that is yet future for us. In our modern nations, in the United States of America, which says, you know, in God we trust. Well, they don't trust in God anymore. They've thrown God out a long time ago in the schools and the courts and every place else. They removed God. What do you think is going to happen one day when they future? They are going to be armed. You know, they'll have their missiles. They'll have their tanks. They'll have their battleships. They'll have all this stuff, but it's going to mean nothing. It's going to mean absolutely nothing. Their enemies are going to have a field day. God allow it. Children of Ephraim, armed, armed shooters of bows, turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law. Well, that's the bottom line of our societies in the Western world right there. God knows, uh, he knows the score. And you can know the score too just by reading this uh, Psalm 78 and verse 10 where we are. You know, people talk, you know, what's going to happen right now? Speculate, what's going to happen in 2016? Well, I can tell you it isn't going to be good. <laughs> because, look, the, he, the people in the Western world, the United States, Canada, Britain, France, you know, Germany, wherever else you want to go, they did not keep the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law. You know, they forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. 
He did marvelous things in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through and made the waters to stand in a heap. We have all these things, this account in the book of Exodus. You know, Charlton Heston, the Ten Commandments, you know, movie, you know, you know, but now we just consider it fairy, you know, fairy tales. Verse 14, and in the daytime he led them with a cloud and at night with a light of fire. He split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as from the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. Well, I've, I've said it before and I, I suppose I'll say it one more time, you know, and you can listen to me and think, you're, you're absolutely bonkers, Jeff. But, you know, when I was in the Sinai Desert in 1973, running around the Sinai Desert with the former uh, military governor of the Sinai, Major Rotem. He said, you know, he said, I want to show you something. I mean, he knew this area intimately, and we went in our Land Rover, and we went to this area. He walked us. We got out of the, at a certain point, and we had to walk. We walked around Mount Sinai, and there we came through this enormous rock. This enormous rock was not a connected to the mountain. It was like a boulder that had some, at some point in time, the distant past, it rolled down from somewhere up the, and was just lying, you know, at the base of the mountain, away from the mountain, you know. I mean, it was, you know, close, but not, it was completely separate rock, enormous rock, a rock that was bigger, you know, went up high, you know, at least high, higher than the ceiling in this room. It would have filled, it was enormous. I mean, it spread far wider than the arms. I couldn't reach around it. I did take about a dozen of us to reach around. It was a great big rock. And you saw there, you saw lips, as it were, splits in the rock. And you could see, having come down, you could see these water stains. This is a Sinai Desert, a rock, and it was separated from the mountain. You have water stains flowing down this thing. Where does that come from? Just... I mean, I've seen it with my own eyes. I'm telling you, it's true. Anyways, you can think I'm nuts, but whatever you might want to think, I do bear testimony to this. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. Yet, verse 17, they continue to sin still more against them by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. You know, this is a testimony to the blindness of carnality, of, of carnal people. They saw all that they did, and yet, what did they do? The, the power of sin in people's lives. They don't get it, what it does to us. Verse 18, they tempted God in their heart and by asking food for their lust. Yea, they spoke against God. They said, can God set a table in the wilderness? Prepareth a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Well, let's go to another place. Let's go to Malachi. Let's go to Malachi and the, the prophet Malachi, the last of the Old Covenant prophets. Malachi chapter uh, 1 and verse 6. I'm going to cite this one in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. God asks this of his people. At this point in time, they'd come back from Babylon from being captured. They were there. This was the period just, they had reestablished the temple from the standpoint, you know, after it had been destroyed. But the people, there was still a problem with the people. A son honors his father and a servant his master. But if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is your fear of me? says the Lord of hosts. To you priests, to you religious leaders, if I'm a master, if I'm a father, where's your reverent honor of me? Are you listening to what I have to say? Are you doing what I asked you to do? Are you making excuses? Are you doing your own thing? What, what's going on here? Who despise my name? Yet you ask, how have we despised your name? By presenting defiled food on my altar, you ask, how have we defiled you? You say the Lord's table is contemptible. When you present a blind animal for sacrifice, is it not wrong? When you present a lame or sick animal, is it not wrong? Bring it to your governor. Would he be pleased with you or show you favor? Okay, if you're going to give a gift, God specified very clearly in the scriptures, see, it's making a point here. I told you the proper way of offering me worship. This is what it's about. 
this God is saying. You're not worshiping me the way I asked you to. You're doing your own thing. You're doing, well, this is good enough. This is good enough, this worship that I'm offering you. It's my worship to you. Take it, God, you know, whatever. And God says, it's, it's not what I asked. You're dishonoring me by not doing what I said. Look, 99% of the religious people in this nation who call themselves Christians are doing exactly the same thing, spiritually speaking. They're offering to God what he didn't ask. They're saying, that's my offer to you, so why aren't you happy with it? You've got to be happy with it. It's what I feel like I am going to, that's what I want to give you. But it's not what God said. It's not what God said. When you present a blind animal for sacrifice, is it not wrong? When you present a lame or sick animal, is it not wrong? Bring it to your governor. Would he be pleading with you or show you favor? Hey, if the law of the land says you do this and that, and you say, no, I'm not going to do this or that, I'm going to do what I want to do, what do you think is going to happen to you? Verse 9, and now ask for God's favor. Will he be gracious to us? Since, he has, since this has come from your hands, will he show it, uh, any of you favor, says the Lord of hosts? I wish one of you would shut the temple doors so it would no longer kindle useless fire on my, my altar. See, people offer the traditions of men. This is the way Jesus put it. They worship me in vain according to the, you know, they're teaching the traditions of men instead of obeying the commandments of God. This is what's going on. This is what's going on. I'm not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will accept no offering from your hands, for my name will be great among the nations from the rising of the sun to its setting. Incense and pure offerings will be presented in my name in every place because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you were profane it when you say, the Lord's table is defiled and its product, its food, is contemptible. Or as the New Living Translation puts this verse, but you dishonor my name with your actions. By bringing contemptible food, you are saying it's all right to defile the Lord's table. By doing what God says you shouldn't be doing, you know, and refusing to do what he does say. <laughs> I mean, that's what it means. And yet, you know, our religious people today, and, the, and, and my people, don't get it. They don't get it. And yet God is not going to be pleased with this. They're saying the Lord's table is defiled and it is contemptible. Let's go to Proverbs 9. You know, this whole idea of Shulhan, you prepare a table uh, before me in the presence of my enemy. You know, there are, there are good uses of the word table. God uses it also. There's another context of this. And let's take a look at this one here in Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 1. Proverbs being written just uh, shortly, you know, the, the generation following David. It said, Wisdom has built her house. She has made its seven columns, that is, the pillars in a large house. She has prepared her food and prepared her wine. <coughs> she has set her table. Okay, wisdom is setting a table. It's laying it out in all in order. She has sent out her servant girls and calls out from the highest places of the city, which, of course, in the highest place of the city would be the temple. You know, thinking of Jerusalem is on Mount Zion, the highest place in the city. She says to those who are uneducated, the naive, the immature, the simple-minded, come in. Come in here, you foolish people who lack sense. Come in and eat my food and drink the wine I have prepared. You see, it's, it's, you're coming to God's table and you're going to eat the food he's prepared and the drink he's prepared. Not the stuff you're going to bring in a boot, you know. It's not going to be this, you know, this, you know the plunk you're going to drink in, you know, or, you know, some sort of, you know, old bread or whatever it might be. No, he's saying you can eat the food I've prepared. Drink the drink I've mixed or prepared. Verse 6, stop your foolish ways and you will live. Take the road of understanding. See, when we come to the Lord's table, we're going to eat what he's prepared. 
and what he is offering for us. Very important. Let's go to Matthew. Let's go to the New Covenant Scriptures. Let's take a look here a little more. This whole image of eating at God's table. Let's take a look at this. Matthew 8 and verse 5. I'm going to cite here the Amplified Version. As Jesus went into Capernaum, and Capernaum is a great location, by the way, because it's right on what we call in the Sea of Galilee or Lake Kinneret. It's just a big freshwater lake. It's a beautiful location, okay, on the west side of the lake. Anyways, a Roman centurion, who is a centurion, is an, an army officer. He has a, you know, a, a lead, well, he has 100 men under him that he, they're responsible for. A uh, centurion came up to him, came up to Jesus. Okay, so here he is, a guy in the Roman army, begging him for help and saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed with intense and terrible, tormenting pain. Now, this is interesting because to the Romans, life was cheap. And this is a servant, is his slave, okay? But he's concerned about the guy's suffering. And he came, he was concerned enough that he was going to come to a Jewish rabbi yeah, think about that for a little bit. Verse 8, but the centurion, it's, and anyways, verse 7, Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Verse 8, but the centurion replied to him, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Well, he was a Gentile. All right, it, you know, Jesus was willing to do it for the sake of the servant. Maybe the servant was Jewish, I don't know. It doesn't say. But only say the word, the centurion said, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man subject to authority. That is the authority of someone with a higher rank, with soldiers subject to me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. See, he recognized that Jesus had a higher rank, a higher authority, and all Jesus had to do was say it, and it would be done. Verse 10, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those who were following him, I tell you truthfully, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. See, he, God responds to faith. See, he reveals his faith to faith. It's this, this, this reaction that goes from faith to faith. And it can be held by anybody. You don't have, it's, your ethnicity has nothing to do with it from this standpoint, from God's perspective. Verse 11, and I say to, uh, to you that many, that is many Gentiles, will come from the east and west and will sit down to feast at the table and enjoy God's promises. This is the way the Amplified puts it. They're going to sit down at the table and, you know, and feast and enjoy God's promises with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven because they had faith. That, you know, that Jesus was the Savior. Verse 12, while the sons and heirs of the kingdom, that is the actual physical descendants who refuse to recognize and listen to the teachings of Jesus Christ. You see, it's not enough to say, oh yeah, Jesus is the Christ. You have to also do what he says. Who, And that's part of recognizing him as this Lord and Messiah will be thrown out to the outer darkness. In that place, which is, you know, the farthest removed from the kingdom of God, there will be, Jesus said, weeping, that's that because of sorrow and pain, and grinding of teeth. You grind your teeth because you're stressed, you're in distress, and you're angry. There'll be weeping and grinding of teeth. Let's go to Luke. Let's go to Luke. Jesus continues on in this aspect of what he says to his people. Prepare us a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Uh, Luke chapter 12 and verse 35. Jesus said to his disciples, those who were listening to him, this is what he said. He said, be dressed and ready for active service and keep your lamps continuously burning. So this shows you're, you're, on, you're on task. You're dressed, you're ready for action, keeping your lamps burning specifically two, two millennia ago, you know, trimming your oil wicks, keeping the oil in the lamp and this sort of stuff. You were, you, were, you were on task. You were keeping up with what you needed to do. Verse 36, be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that when he knock, comes and knocks, they may immediately open the door for him. Blessed, that is happy, prosperous, to be admired, are those servants whom the master finds awake and watching when he arrives. 
I assuredly, uh, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, he will prepare himself to serve and will have them recline at the table. You know, sit down at the table. He's going to prepare a, a table before us, before his people, and will come and wait on them. What a picture. I mean, the Messiah come, I will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. He will come and wait on them and serve them. Verse 38, whether he comes in the second watch, which was before midnight, or even the third watch after midnight and finds them so prepared, that is ready, blessed are those servants. So whenever Christ is going to come, whatever that might be, his servants are continuing, they're on task. They, you know, they're focused on what they need to be doing. They haven't, as it were, you know, the, the figurative example or the metaphor is falling asleep, so they're not on task. Verse 39, be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time the thief was coming, he would not have, he would have been awake and alert and would have allowed his house to be broken into. You too can be continually ready for, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So he's coming at a time that people aren't going to get. And the only way, you know, you, you can't say, well, when I see things get ready, then I'll repent, then I'll start going to church, then I'll do this, then I'll, then I'll you know, start serving God. When I, in the meantime, I want to do my thing. That's not how it's going to work. <laughs> You're not going to impress God with that. I'm, you know, he's saying that. You too be continually ready because the Son of Man is coming in an hour that you do not expect. And Peter said to him, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us? That is the disciples or to everyone as well. Okay, who's this for? <laughs> and then he gives this whole thing about the faithful steward. Jesus the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise steward, and that is of God's estate, whom his master will put in charge of the household to give his servants their portion of food at the proper time. See, they're going to have this. Uh, they're going to have this responsibility to prepare a table for the people of God, the household, the people who are in the household. Blessed is that servant whom the master finds so doing when he arrives. I assuredly and most solemnly tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. And he gives a word of caution, but because those who don't, you know what's going to happen. You're going to get punished. This is what he says in the next number of versions, and he puts it out here. And he finishes that for everyone to whom much is given here in verse 48, the latter part of that, much more will be required. Much will be required, I guess. And to whom they entrust much of him, they will ask all the more. We're given the knowledge we're given. We're giving God's spirit to work with, to bear fruit, to produce good things for God. And then it's his service. This is what we should be. We need to be continually doing this and ready and on task. We can't fall asleep and just start to do our own thing. Expect God's going to be pleased with that. Let's go to Luke, the following chapter, chapter 13, verse 13. Jesus had lots of people listen to him. He had thousands and thousands and thousands of people listen to him. Many even would say he was the Messiah, but how many would obey him? Jesus had something to say, and it's something that bears really close thinking. And really pay attention to this. Luke chapter 13 and verse 22. That is, Jesus went through one town and village after another, teaching and making his way to Jerusalem. Lord, someone asked them, are there few being saved? Are there just a few being saved? And he said to them, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door. What is sometimes, in, you know, King James English is a straight gate. That's the narrow gate. See, in any city wall, you had this big wide gate, and then you'd have a little, a little narrow gate. Little narrow gates, by the way, are easier to defend. <laughs> just out of curiosity. Of just, and, you know, but anyways, it's make every effort to enter through the narrow door because I tell you, many will try to enter and won't be able. Once the homeowner gets up and shuts the door, then you will be outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open for us. And he will answer you, I don't know you or where you're from. Who are you? And they will say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. We said Jesus all the time. 
But he will say, I tell you, I don't know you or where you're from. Get away from me, all you workers of unrighteousness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth in that place. And you will see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourselves thrown out. And they will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. See, he will prepare, uh, he will prepare a table for them, even in the presence of their enemies. And note this, he says, he concludes here in verse 30 in this, some who are last will be first, and some who are first will be last. When he says here, you know, get away from me, all you workers of unrighteousness, the word for unrighteousness is adikia. Properly, it's the opposite of justice. Unrighteousness is a violation of God's standards. It's a violation of what God teaches. It's a violation of his word, which brings divine disapproval. It's a count of violation, you know, as a transgression of God's justice, of what he approves, of his righteous judgments. We're going to be judged by the words of this book, not by the assumptions people make, all sorts of people will take this book and use allegory and come up with allegorical reason to not do what the book says. They've been doing this for centuries. But Jesus says we have to enter into the straight gate. And he's going to say to certain people, he's going to say, get away from me, all you workers of unrighteousness. We don't want, I don't want, wouldn't want that being said of me. And you don't either. We want to be awake. We want to be ready and about doing our master's business, our Lord's business, so that when he knocks on the door, whatever it might be, and we, you know, he says, you're not going to expect it. He's going to find us you know, doing what we ought to be doing, doing what the book says, living by it. Let's go to Matthew. Uh, again, we'll just proceed a little farther here in Luke. Luke <clears throat> chapter 16, Luke chapter 16, verse uh, 19, 16, 19. We have this whole story of Lazarus and the rich man. There was a rich man who would dress in purple and fine linen. Okay, he was putting on the big show. <laughs> he was driving his BMW chariot, okay? All right, anyways, feasting lavishly every day, but a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, was left at his gate, and he longed to be filled with fell from the rich man's table, but instead the dogs would come and lick his sores. And you know the story. Eventually they both died. And the angels carried uh, uh, Lazarus away to Abraham's side, it says. Yeah, but, and, <clears throat> but also you see here that it's interesting in this, in this metaphor. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, okay, the place of the dead, he looked up and saw Abraham a long way off with Lazarus at his side. He was looking at, you know, at Lazarus, at, at table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, as it were, sitting at table, maybe with Christ serving them. Father Abraham, he called out, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this flame. Son, Abraham said, remember that during your life you received your good things. <coughs> you did your own thing. You got all the money you wanted, all the babes you wanted, everything you wanted, you did it all, but you didn't, you know, you didn't pay attention. You called the Lord's table contemptible, God's way of life contemptible. You couldn't give it, you're, you're spending your spare time, much less your spare change. Just as Lazarus received bad things, but now he's comforted here while you're in agony. Besides all this, is a great chasm that's been fixed between us, so that those who want to pass over from here to you cannot, and those who, from, who, <clears throat> who want to cross over to us. Because, you see, the gift of immortality will separate that which is flesh is flesh and that which is spirit is spirit. And you, 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 you can't just easily pass from one to another. But, of course, the rich man said, Father, Father Abraham, he said, I beg you to send, uh, send Lazarus to my father's house because I have five brothers and warm them so that they don't come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. 
they should listen to them. No, no, oh, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead would rise and go to them, they would repent. But he told them, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. They're not going to have this miraculous thing. They're not, if they're not going to listen to Moses and the prophets, what are you? Do people today listen to Moses and the prophets? Or do they ignore them, do just the opposite. Say, oh, well, they, they don't really mean this. It means, it means that. It means what we want it, want it to mean. In the presence of my enemies. Let's go to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew here. Matthew 25. Matthew 25. And verse 31. 25, 31. Now when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory and he shall gather before him all the nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then shall the king say to those at his right hand, come, you who are blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared to you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat, and I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you, hunger, or feed you, and thirsty, and gave you drink? Then he will say, and, and when did we see you a stranger, and took you in, or naked, and clothed you? And when do we see you sick or in prison and, 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 come, to, uh, and come to you? And, and answering, the king shall say to them, Truly I say to you, inasmuch as you have done this to the least of these my brethren, you have done it to me. Then shall he say to those on the other left, Depart from me, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you did not give me anything to eat. And I was thirsty, and you did not give me anything to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't take me in. I was naked, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not come and visit me. Then they shall answer him, Lord, when did you, we see you in any of those states? And he will answer them, Truly I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, my brother, neither did, it, uh, uh, neither did you do it to me. And they shall go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. You know, this whole aspect and this parable about Lazarus and the rich man, you know, that you, God prepares a table for his people in the presence of their enemies. That, that's in spite of them. The enemies said they couldn't prevent it. They, they, they didn't have any power to prevent it. The people of God have faced persecution for centuries after centuries after centuries. Those who actually are scripturalists, who want to live by the word of God, you know, they were able, they were burned at the stake. They were persecuted here and there and whatever. But there will come a time when even those who persecute them, they won't be able to, to prevent what Christ is going to do for his people. The friends of God are going to be made to triumph in the very presence of their foes. Their enemies will be compelled to see how God rewards those who practice justice and righteousness and faithfulness. It's going to be quite the day. It's quite the verse. Let's go to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 6. Revelation 19 and verse 6. After that I heard what sounded like the shout of a vast throng, like the boom of many pounding waves, and like the roar of terrific and mighty peals of thunder, exclaiming, Hallelujah! For now the Lord our God, the omnipotent, reigns. Let us rejoice and shout for joy. Let us celebrate and ascribe to him glory and honor. For the marriage of the Lamb at last has come, and his bride has prepared herself. She has been permitted to dress in the fine linen, dazzling and white. For the fine linen signifies the righteousness. That, you know, the righteousness, the upright conduct and deeds, the godly living, the you know, right standing with God of the saints as God's holy people. 
Then the angel said to me, write this down, blessed, that is happy, to be envied are those who are summoned, those who are invited, those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Those who are made to sit down and that Christ himself will serve them. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my foes. And the angel said to me further, these are the true words, the genuine and exact declarations of God. When these things happen, we can truly say, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And it will be an incredible day in the future when we do sit down and see these things fulfilled. Let's keep faith in this coming year, this Roman tax year of 2016. Let's not fall asleep, but let us be continually waiting and doing our Master's will. Let's pray.